Welcome to another episode brought to you by Imagine Strength, the future of safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Are you a hit studio owner looking for equipment that's not just top-notch, but also tailored to your specific needs? Imagine Strength is your answer. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength is revolutionizing the hit industry with their state-of-the-art yet affordable equipment. Their team doesn't just sell hit equipment, they live and breathe it. I've personally experienced their gear at the Resistance Exercise Conference, and let me tell you, it was an intense workout that I won't soon forget, in the best way possible, of course. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they provide customized solutions for hit studios. Number two, they have budget-friendly yet high-performance designs. And number three, they're committed to innovation and excellence in high-intensity training specifically. Founder Jeff Turner and his dedicated team are on a mission to make HIT accessible to everyone. Getting started is easy. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, consult with their expert team. And number three, choose the equipment that will skyrocket your business. Don't wait. Head over to imaginestrength.com and elevate your HIT studio today with Imagine Strength. Hey, it's Lawrence here. Hope you're well. Uh, today's podcast is Berde Simone's 40-year journey in personal training, lessons and legacies. Now, before you get into this episode, I actually want to encourage you to go and consume this over on YouTube. Um, I think that most of you will find the YouTube version far more enjoyable since there is a ton of reference to Bill's presentation. Bill and I try our best to paint a picture with words, but it's no substitution for the presentation. Um, so I really encourage you to do that. That's um, youtube.com forward slash high intensity business. Um, if you've been following Bill's work for some time, reading his books, listening to his content, etc., I think you will really enjoy learning about his story, which is really what we get into in this one. And uh, we talk about his career timeline and the challenges and discoveries along the way, um, how Bill is helping interns and students of fitness craft careers, three key lessons Bill has gleaned from his career. We talk about managing injuries, what he learned from the 1970s bodybuilding craze and that whole experience, which is quite fascinating and much, much more. So again, please go to YouTube to get the most value out of this one. That's high intensity business. Sorry, that's youtube.com forward slash high intensity business, not high intensity business.com forward slash YouTube. So yeah, youtube.com forward slash high intensity business. Now, if any further ado, please enjoy Berto Simone's 40 year career or 40 year journey in personal training lessons and legacies. Lawrence Neal here and welcome back to high intensity business, the, the one, your one-stop shop for elevating your hip business and fueling your passion for high intensity training. I've said that enough times that you think I could just say it off the top of my head. This is episode 431. And the, episode, the title for this episode is Billy Simone, 40 years or marking 40 years as a trainer, 40 years of personal training and free lessons for today's trainers. Obviously my guest is Bill. Bill Simone is an ACE certified health coach, senior fitness specialist, and owner of Optimal Exercise in Cranberry, New Jersey, and has certifications in functional anatomy, functional fitness, and orthopedic exercise. He started training people back in 1983 at a sports training institute in New York City. And he's developed the Joint Friendly Fitness Project, which draws on anatomy and biomechanics, providing clients with all the benefits of regular exercise while reducing the risk of injury. He's the author also of Congruent Exercise and Moment Arm Exercise. Bill, welcome back to the show. Really excited to get into this uh, presentation today. Hello, Lawrence. How are you? I'm very good. All the better for seeing you and your amazing backdrop with all your New York Knicks <laughs> merch. Very That's cool. Right. Especially for a Brit like me who's never, ever been to New York and would love to go to Madison Square Garden. So yeah, it's all very cool for me. Very novel. This is, this is the result of probably 20 years of my son and I sharing fandom for the Knicks. Yeah. And uh, over there, you go to a game, you, you pick up something, you get something on eBay and it's stashed in different places. And I think during the shutdown, I said, I might as well clean up the cellar here. And I decided, all right, so this behind me is going to be where all the Knicks <laughs> merchandise is. Um, Bill's man cave. So, <laughs> yes. So it's, and I'm sure your listeners have no idea what we're talking about. But so for me, I do enjoy watching the Knicks, but for me, it's really, it, it was a shared time with my son because he came of, he came of age just as they were starting to really stink, <laughs> which meant tickets were very available and affordable. <laughs> so we went to a lot of games. See, so behind me, you can see that one big 
there's one big poster. There's Patrick. It's uh, Patrick Ewing yeah. and some others under the basket. We had gone to the Patrick Ewing retirement game, and they handed out a lot of free stuff there, and that was a great experience. And then uh, there's Sprewell back there, who, when the Knicks got good again, it was under Sprewell and Allen Houston. So there's a lot of Sprewell and Allen Houston stuff. And my son. I ran into him at an event, and then my wife and I also got our pictures taken with him at a different event. So there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Outside the garden, depending on the event, the vendors are handing out. Ultimately, they're souvenirs, right? Because you have to physically be there to get it in your hand. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that stuff on the wall. There's Jeremy Lin stuff. And then the TV there. There it is. Yep. That's where we watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. And I love it. It's that's, so much that's, that's mem where I memories. Watch it anyways. Yeah. Absolutely. So many memories wrapped up in all of that. Let's get into today's topic. I love the pictures that everyone can see. If you're in, you want to probably go to YouTube, by the way. Obviously, we're going to try and describe everything. If you're just listening to this, we'll do our best to describe what, what Bill's going to go through. From what I understand, a lot of it, to be fair, could be understood and enjoyed just as much just listening. But the beauty of being able to look at it right now is you get to see these really old school pictures of Bill, which look amazing. You look really muscular in that central picture, Bill, where you're running. Let's see. First of all, any discussion of my last 40 years, I would be very remiss if I didn't mention my wife and family. That, that top picture there is from 1984, clearly when we got married. And then the one below that is, I don't know, whenever we had reason to get dressed up. And then below that is basically our family now with our grown daughter and son and his wife and dogs. So like I said, any discussion of my last 40 years would be, would miss a very big point if I didn't mention them. And then more selfishly and more egotistically. <laughs> so that picture you're referring to, that I think was a, either a biathlon or a triathlon, probably in the 80s. Below that was in the mid nineties when I probably got the, well, no, that was the best bodybuilding shape I could get into. And the last, <laughs> the best bodybuilding and the last bodybuilding shape. And then adjacent to that, there's me in front of the world trade. Actually, I was in Jersey city and that's across the river looking at the world trade center. And I have my sports training Institute uniform on. So that was again, mid eighties. Mm -hmm. And then below that was a couple of summers ago when I foolishly did the Spartan Deca fitness death match, okay. which is a, a really silly fitness obstacle course that thrives on suffering. Um, and did you get injured or were you okay? I, I did, there's 10 events and then there's a, a run in between events. Mm -hmm. And it was a, about a hundred degrees at a hundred percent humidity. Oh. And midway through the ninth event, I didn't, I, I trained wrong for it. In the middle of it, I said, I turned to the judge, I said, I'm done. And she said, don't you want to try? I said, no, I know I can't, you know, this, this was lifting a 60 pound sandbag over your shoulder 20 times. Okay. And I had practiced for it by lifting a 60 pound dumbbell to my shoulder 20 times. But I didn't account for the sandbag oozing all over the place. So I couldn't lift it cleanly. And between that and the humidity, I said, ah, forget it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Funny part of it is she says, why don't you do the run and come back into the 10th event? I say, okay. And then the head judge comes over and asks what happened. She tells her, and the head judge starts giving me grief about, oh, you can't quit. I don't allow quitters here. And I'm like, no, I just did. I, I know my body. I'm done. And then she starts in on my wife and daughter. And my daughter just said, lady, you, you picked the wrong guy to do this with. <laughs> <laughs> I come back from the run and, and she says, she keeps badgering me. So I said, look, if you stop talking, I will do that last event. And she said, oh, that's great. I couldn't have you quit on yourself. And I said, you talk now. I'm not doing it. <laughs> but I went and did the last event anyway. Uh. But the, the training for it, it's box jumps. It's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff that is going to create injuries for people. And even though I tried to train for it as precisely and as joint friendly as possible, you just couldn't avoid it. It's just too many reps. It's just too many, too many possibilities for bad moves. And frankly, there was no room for me in that world because 
there were plenty of people who were really hurting doing it. And that, that, that obstacle course boot camp mentality doesn't acknowledge that it just, it's just all encouragement and all push, push, push. And there's just, there's, it's not, there wasn't a place for what I do there, but I got a good picture oh. out of it. So there, yeah, it looks there great. I am, there I am out running a parked van. There's that. Uh, great definition in the shoulder and the side pectoral. I was in shape for it, but the thing is I could have gotten in shape without doing those exercises. Without practicing those stunts. But anyway, right. so, so moving on so we don't get too bogged down. The, so when I realized earlier this year that this September marked 40 years since I started as a trainer, it occurred to me that somewhere in there, there was something useful to individual trainers and exercisers today. Not in the specifics because so much has changed about the industry and the environment but more in terms of like relatable situations. So I narrowed it down to three, three broad lessons I learned, which is the first one is to use your experiences. The second one is to manage your own injuries. Cause obviously as a trainer, if you're not working, <laughs> you're not earning. Mm -hmm. and, and the last one is to understand the nature of personal training which for me was difficult because I've never paid a trainer to train me. So was we, that a mistake, go, do you think? That, or maybe we could talk about that later, actually, in terms of paying a trainer. Maybe that, that no. comes last in the sequence. No, because when I, in 1983, now granted, this is a New York view of the world. In 1983, the only place that personal training was being done was New York City. Okay. So it didn't really exist in the suburbs. Where, I, where I, I'm ultimately from. So there wasn't the opportunity to pay a trainer because you didn't know this type of thing existed. You, you trained with training partners or gyms at the time weren't as crassly commercial as they are now. So you would join a local gym or it was a local bodybuilder, local weight trainer, and he would just help you to keep you coming every month. But having worked in places and Nautilus fitness centers and such, you were actually in the suburbs, you were discouraged from paying too much attention to any one person at a time. So when I discovered Sports Training Institute in 1983, and no, that is the point. You were coaching one person at a time. I just thought it was phenomenal. It was great. But my peers and I, we had all trained ourselves and trained with training partners. So it never occurred to us to pay a trainer to train us because people were paying us to train them. Mm -hmm. And at this point in life, I know my body better than any other trainer. So another trainer can say, okay, Bill, push. And I'm like, no, I can feel my shoulder about to tear. I'm not pushing through that. <laughs> so, so you don't think there'd be value now you being trained by a trainer where you are in life at this stage? Is that what you're saying? Because of your knowledge not, and knowledge only, of because body. I, only because I know my body better than a trainer knows, my, better than an external person knows my body. Mm. I will do it with the interns as a way of teaching them how to train. But for my own benefit, I, like I said, at this point, I know my body, I know my injuries, I know my mm. joints. I know how hard I want to push, which is not very, by the way. But you just remind me, do you train to muscular failure these days or is it just shy of that? In the way that like James Fisher and that define it in their research, if we're going to be specific. Uh, keep, in, keep in mind, I'm 20 years older than James. So when I heard <laughs> your last podcast with him, he's talking about how people just pushed out. No, I'm not pushing it out. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I definitely hold back. Sure. I've been holding back from teeth gnashing, vein popping, contorting for a long time. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I had lim eliminated that a long time ago. And now I'm more inclined to, I, I recently read quotes by Jones and Darden that especially, and I assume this came when they got older, that they said they know when their last good rep is, they don't have to fail to prove it. And that's where I find myself also. So if I do train to the point of real discomfort or real, real severe muscle burn, ready to vomit, that type of thing. That's once in a while. And then I go back to more moderate training. Mm -hmm. I have to say, honestly, 
I don't know if I had always trained moderately, if it would have made a difference. Like I know what I did and I know the result it, it, I got, which was that bottom picture there and the, the muscle maker picture and the picture above that. Mm -hmm. When I was making a point of training to failure and doing a lot of cardio and hard dieting, I'm just not convinced now that the extra What's the current cliche that the juice isn't worth the squeeze? Yeah, so oh. interesting. And, and by the way, I, I recently came across a, a, a stash of muscle magazines from the 1920s to the 1970s. So ending where I started. So I hmm. started mid-70s. These ended. And it wasn't until the 70s with Arnold and Arthur Jones that weight training was made to look like agony. Mm, like that whole stretch of time between the 20s and the 70s, the gist of the training was do enough, don't strain, and periodically increase the weight. And it was only, it was only Arnold grimacing in muscle and fitness. Like pre-Arnold in muscle and fitness, guys did not grimace in muscle magazines. Mm. Their faces were relaxed. They, and again, these were obviously pictures, so I don't know what they were doing. But what else was different in the early magazines that was interesting to you and how they portray training? I'm just interested to talk about that for a second. The pre-1970s stuff? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because you see, obviously, the physiques are quite different because there wasn't any or much steroid use. So the physiques just look very natural and strong. Yes. that's Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But I think that the, the thing that jumps out is that it was more about physical culture than it was about excessively bodybuilding or being as big and ripped as possible. What do you mean by physical culture? It had to do more with an overall healthy lifestyle, not mm -hmm. getting too excessive. So in other words, in, in the early bodybuilding contest, it was like an athletic component. So not a, no matter how much guys lifted, they had to be able to do some kind of hand balancing or some kind of Olympic lifting. Yep. And now I say that knowing full well that what's written in magazines isn't necessarily true. But in terms of just the general, what, came, what comes across to the reader is how moderated it is. And, and the physiques look very attainable pre-1970s. Actually, we have some slides with that so we can get more into that. Okay. So, yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah. So all of this, so, so for the listeners, it's, it's not quite a resume, but it's like a year-by-year -year breakdown of what I did. So. Before 1983, I had graduated Rutgers in 1980. I went to work on Wall Street. Um, training in the suburbs, it was generally locally owned gyms, free weights, and then Nautilus came a little later when the racquetball clubs get it, got in there and the Nautilus Fitness Center started to open. Mm -hmm. In uh, 1983, uh, um, I'm going to go into how it came about later. I went to work in New York City at the Sports Training Institute. I spent two years there as a trainer, two years as a business staff. 87, I went into other management. I managed law firms, sports medicine practices, other medical practices. How come you managed, what do you mean you managed a law firm as like a office manager type of role? As a finance administrator. Oh, okay. Because the, yes, I graduated Rutgers with a business degree. Okay because I wasn't paying attention. Okay, this ties into the use your experience line, okay? I would, go to, I would go to the library at Rutgers, theoretically to research business stuff. And I, they, had a, they had these journals. One was called Scholastic Coach and one was called The Athletic Journal. And it was writ written mainly to high school and college coaches, sports coaches. But Arthur Jones was starting to write articles for him with a very different tone than the muscle magazines of the time. A anyone who's read Jones, if you haven't read muscle magazines from the seventies and then read Jones's stuff written in the seventies, you wouldn't know the difference. You, you, you're, you can't appreciate the difference, but there's both were very hyperbolic, but one was really gonzo. They were just gonzo in different directions, <laughs> but compared to the muscle magazines, Jones sounded like it was a more serious take. So, um, so I had the business degree, but I had been, but most of my time in the library was spent reading that stuff. 
conditioning and training stuff. Yeah. Also, just so sorry, then, just on your tra- just on your time as a trainer in New York and Wall Street, I'm just really curious. Does it mirror a lot of what Pete Serqua has shared on the podcast in terms of the the type of clientele he had, the brash clients, the demanding, the kind of no BS, fast paced atmosphere? Was it? Can you relate to a lot of that in personal training in that area? Well, um, I wasn't at that time. I wasn't personal training on Wall Street. I was working in Wall Street. I see. Oh, I, I see. Sorry. I was working on the Florida Stock Exchange. I was working in, in banks okay. and such. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm a little older than Pete, and I was in New York a little before him. I think he probably hit a little more of the wave than I did. I was on the upward part of the wave, and I think he was right at the peak. 90s, when the economy was really booming around that time, Yeah, right? so I was in, yeah. in the 80s where it wasn't quite the same. Yeah. And, and Sports Training Institute, probably was the first commercial place to offer personal training. Actually, you know what? I have slides about that. <laughs> so anyway, Fair so, enough. so when I was on the business side of Sports Training Institute, when it was time to move on, I moved on in the business direction. And so I became a finance administrator at a law firm, sports medicine practices, other medical practices. And then 96, I went back to Sports Training Institute, but now I went as the manager, not as, as a training staff or a business staff. Mm -hmm. because I had the chops from the other management until 2001 when I said that's enough and I've been working in New Jersey for myself since then. But this, and we can bat around the specific details, but the general point to today's individual trainer, don't worry, we'll get there. So (laughs) with the interns I get from Rutgers now, the exercise science interns, They benefit from a very specific, very literal aspect of my experience because their department doesn't give them any career options with just a bachelor's degree. So their academic department, since it's staffed by all people with advanced academic degrees, encourages them all to go to grad school, which is fine unless you're not ready financially or you just need a break. And by their own admission, they don't do a good job preparing them for a career with just a bachelor's degree. Now, by virtue of all that experience that now show up as my LinkedIn connections, I sit down with the interns and I show them my connections with XY's bachelor's degrees. Mm -hmm. And then I show them the career path they took and the job titles and the extra credentials they got. And then I show them the employers and the job titles. And then I show them where they can get on the job posting lists and find out the the job requirements and the the compensations and stuff and get notified by job openings, which I, I, the middle slide there is what I presented to the Kinesiology and Health Careers Club, which I have on YouTube. I'll give you a link for that later. Okay. And then they have a health, they have a, a career fair, which I attend. So they, so my experience very literally, very specifically helps them because I can point to other people with the same degree as them and show them what they can do with it, with it. And most of them do go on to grad school, but they're very relieved to realize there's something else they can do with some substance like corporate fitness, which if someone gets an exercise bachelor's and you're not ready for grad school yet, the corporate fitness realm, which has a distinct career path and is the place to be, at least until you get get situated with where you want to go on to for your next degree. And sorry, just for the, the ignorant British and myself, I say ignorant British, I'm really just speaking for myself. What is grad school? So if they've already gone, they've already got a bachelor's, they've gone to college, right? Which would oh, be they, called they, university. No, they get a master's degree or they get a PhD. Oh, okay. A master's right? or PhD. Got it. Yeah. And like I said, the faculty at the Rutgers kinesiology department, they all have advanced degrees because they're working in academia. Mm-hmm. So of course they think the thing to do with the bachelor's degree is to use it as the prerequisite to a, a, a master's degree. Just I, that's what they did. I, on the other hand, am not burdened with that. <laughs> so I, I know what to do with bachelor's degrees. And, but, but more importantly, I know people who've done stuff with that bachelor's degree. So I've also made the personal introductions to them. So for instance, on the, in the left-hand corner, it's a recent 
the intern during the shutdown, as you can tell, because we have masks on. I'm showing her how to do core work. And then below that is another intern pre-shutdown. I'm setting them up on the leg press. And then they set me up, right? In the middle is a current intern, John A. We're doing manual resistance there. I just put a video up about. And then we have Kylie and Carly. Carly is coaching Kylie on chin-up station. Also during the shutdown. <laughs> to the right of them is Emily and Sabrina. Now, Emily went to work for Roger Schwab for a year. And Sabrina went to work for Adam Zickerman for a year. Mm -hmm. And then each of them went to grad school. And Emily went for education, master's, and Sabrina got, became an RN. And as a matter of fact, we are in Hacked, which I believe you had. I've just tried. I, I have. I've just brought up the website because I couldn't remember. It's terrible. And apologies. Pamela Gold. Okay. See, as I had her on the podcast, I couldn't remember her first name. I was like, I know it's gold. Yeah, Pamela's business. Yep. So with Emily and Sabrina, that's when I realized that they weren't prepared to do something with the bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. So we made a, I made a point of bringing them into New York and we went to Adams and we went to Hack and we went to several other places where I, again, where my experience helps, where I knew people yeah. because they weren't familiar with commercial fitness, like what there was to do with it. So we went to some membership gyms. We went to Hack, which was different than, very different than Adams. Yeah. Uh, Emily, I eventually brought down to see Roger's place. For those that don't know hacked, it's more, it might have moved on a little bit, but last time I, I, I heard it was more biohacking, ARX, Carol bike, that type but, of stuff. Which is what Emily's on right there is the Carol bike. Yeah. Okay. And then below that, the women in the middle were the interns and I had them bring their friends in to train mm -hmm. so they could practice, frankly. On the right is Ashley, who's now in physical therapy school. And on the left is Ariel, who she and her sister were hugely helpful in getting joint friendly fitness publishable. Okay. So once I've trained them, uh, once I've trained the interns as if they are clients, and then once they practice on each other, then I have them bring in a friend who doesn't know what's coming <laughs> so they can get the friend to do, they can coach the friend, mm -hmm. right? Because if they train me, I ultimately know what we're trying to do. So it's not the same as trying to tell somebody who doesn't know what you actually want and get them to do what you want. So, so, that's, so should they go on to do some personal training, they will at least have gotten some reps in before they actually, before they actually fully intended paying. Yeah. 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 So that's great what you're doing. It, now the general point that I was beating around the bush beating around there was though, is that I, I learned something from every experience and it, especially in the first 20 years and more often than not, I was able to use it in the next experience. If the first experience was a negative and I watched what happened and saw it unroll, when something similar happened the next time I said, wait a minute, I've seen this before. Mm. So. Now, very specific to individual trainers. So when I look at this timeline, what I see is, oh, so you probably can't relate to this, but in the eighties and nineties, if you lived within a 200 mile radius of New York city, it wasn't just common, it was expected that you would commute into New York City for work. Yeah. So I spent, so for me to work in New York City, I would have to give it two hours in the morning and two hours at night. So if you work nine to five, your day was really seven to seven. Now today with remote work and such, that's probably never, that will never mm -hmm. come back. But in the eighties and nineties, that was, like I said, if you lived in a big radius of New York, that's where Wall Street was. That's where Madison Avenue was. It's, it was just the place to go to work. Yep. So when I look at this timeline, I see seven years of commuting into New York. I see a two year break to work in New Jersey. Then something I had gotten started when I was in New York panned out. So I went back into New York for five more years. 
Then I couldn't take it. I went back to New Jersey for a couple of years. <laughs> and then something else panned out. And I went back into New York for five more years. And then I cracked it. I've been in New Jersey since 2001. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but, but, what, what's your commute like now to your studio? Yeah, about 10 minutes. Lovely. Yeah. It's been about 10 minutes since 2006. But, That's great. But now for the individual trainer out there, I don't know, where you are, do trainers, is it common for trainers to go to people's homes to deliver training sessions? I don't think so, no. It's probably done, oh, okay. but it's not overly common. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So in the New York metropolitan area, mm. and I can't speak for other parts of the country, very common. It, it's more common where I am in central New Jersey for trainers to go to people's homes than to have a standalone studio. Okay. So what happens is they meet the trainer in the big commercial health club, and then the trainer trains them at home or word of mouth or however. Mm -hmm. So now I, so in 2001, I had just finished on and off spending four hours a day getting to and from work. And one day my I get five calls from prospective clients, not from anything I did, but because their trainer abruptly left. And they had a Friday workout. They said, see you Monday. The trainer said, nope, I'm leaving. And the, and the client said, for vacation? She goes, nope, I'm moving to Hawaii. And then when I saw where the people were coming from, I realized what happened. She had a half hour, 45 minute drive between homes. Right? So I spent four hours a day. Two, I've spent a two hour chunk getting to work to go to New York. She was spending the same amount of time, but in half hour jumps in between clients. Mm -hmm. So with the, and again, user experience, right? With the experience of spending way too much time getting to and from work, when these people called, I didn't say yes to everything. I said yeah. yes to a, the, the ones that I, were in a narrow geography that I knew I could handle without running myself ragged. Okay, so you did a bit of mobile training then. Very little because okay. ultimately, I think it works better. If you go to someone's home, you're the guest in their home. Right. If they come to your studio, that, that's very attitude, different. That, that <laughs> attitude levels out a little bit, right? You're now my client. You're in As my a, space now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not your trainer. Like in your home, he's my trainer. Yeah. But in yeah. my studio, you're my client. And I'm not saying that trainers shouldn't do that. And some trainers make a lot of money doing that. I'm just saying temperamentally, that wasn't for me based on, again, I spent a lot of time getting to and from work. Yeah. But I think if you're the trainer doing that, you have to really keep an eye on burning out so you don't just snap one day. In, in the New York metropolitan area, I know at least three people that, yes, you're making great money. You're hobnobbing with the rich and famous, but you're starting at 6 a.m. and you're wrapping up at 9 p.m. and you have a half hour drive in between each client. And at some point you wear out. Again, I'm not saying don't do it because you don't really know where your business is going to come from or where it's going to take you, but you should probably keep an eye on it. If you feel like you're burning out, you have to try to prune your schedule a little bit. You have to manage it. Otherwise, because again, if you as the trainer burn out, you're not getting a salary. Yeah. I'm not a fa fan of the model either, but I think I understand why some people start that way. They're just getting started or if they're, I think it's, it's more of a young person's game probably uh, based on the hours and such. But if people listening to this do want to actually know how to build that type of business, Craig Huber did that back in the day. So we did a podcast a long time ago, but if you just Google or sorry, not Google, or you could Google uh, or search on a website, Craig Hubert mobile hit or just Craig Hubert hit, it will come up as well. Sorry, Bill, go on. Again, I'm not, it's, not that it's not for me because I personally think, elaborate on this maybe later, you're trying to get somebody who is having trouble exercising. That's a big enough hurdle that they have to admit they need help exercising. Mm -hmm. And now you're inviting yourself into their home. So I was, just, I was always more comfortable inviting them or not even inviting them, but just having an independent location. But again, plenty of trainers do it. My only advice is, at some point, it's not enough to work. You have to look at how you're working. And if you want to last at it, 
you, you really have to manage some of the, some of these things that can wear you out before you realize it. Mm -hmm. So let's get back on track here. The experience. And then there's some more specific things that, so for instance, I worked for the bank on wall street and I was an auditor, which seems completely unrelated to the training business, except when I went to the business side of sports training Institute and I saw how receipts were handled. I realized that they were getting ripped off left and right. So I was able to use some of the stuff I learned at bank auditing and I inflicted, <laughs> and I imposed it on the front desk, at which point several of them quit because they realized the jig was up. <laughs> oh, wow. so, so this is very irrelevant to today where I think people pay with credit card or Venmo or, or, or probably the yeah. dominant payment. But at the time, people would pay with cash or check. And they would pay cash. The receptionist would, might update the client record. But then the cash might not have actually gotten into the bank. I, again, since I had the bank auditing experience, I had them use a, I went to a local office supply store <laughs> when they were such a thing. And I, I got a receipt book and I made every receptionist, if someone paid, they gave a receipt and they attached one copy to the receipt to the currency that went in the safe and one copy of the receipt stayed in the book. And this way, and I told everyone, look, if I find the receipt and there's no currency, you got a problem. Mm -hmm. And then I also told them, by the way, I'm going to look at what's posted to the client accounts every day. And I'm going to compare that to what went in the bank. And if it doesn't match, you got a problem. Yeah. Um, and then the owner, they said, sometimes the owner takes it. I said, well, you make the owner sign the receipt book and tell them that I said, you were going to have the problem, not him. <laughs> so there was a very specific things like that, that I was able to bring from one position to the next. It's a great so mindset. Yeah, because it's like you're taking all these experiences and sometimes it's hard to see how something you're learning now or doing now, it might not be that interesting to you, how that's going to help you later on in life. That's right. Um, that's right. And yeah, these little skills build up. I used to, uh, when, at Sports Training Institute, when a, a trainer would leave, I would say, oh, what'd you learn here? And the ones that said nothing, I said, you're right, you learn nothing. Because I've learned a ton. I learned about training. I learned about business. I learned about HR. And a lot of it was, I, I was 25. I was not that experienced at the time. So a lot of it was shutting up and watching. But if you're paying attention, you can learn a lot. If you pay it, if you watch it and say, gee, that didn't quite have the desired effect. What would a different way of handling it be? But then in your next position, when a similar situation comes up, you have that to draw on. Right. It's not like every, not like everything you start completely fresh and have to learn from the beginning. Ah, yes. Okay. Managing your own injuries for the listeners. On the left is a picture of me just prior to surgery, right? Not a competition looking physique, but okay. And the middle two pictures <laughs> are some point in the six months following the surgery where there's clearly no definition. There's a spare tire around the, the bicep where all the blood settled and the swelling settled. And then on the right is that picture of Sean Proust and I from Rex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if I'll ever be exactly in the same shape as pre-surgery, but this, and so this was 2016 and this could have been a disaster financially, physically, emotionally. and. So what happened was I really tore up my rotator cuff to the point where there was no other option but surgery. Um, and so I did the surgery and I took as little time off from training people as I could. My clients were very understanding because I had terrible energy. In addition to walk around in a sling for about a month or six weeks or so. And eventually I didn't lose too much, I didn't lose business, too much business over it. I think I'd stayed out a week, which was probably physically a mistake, but I, I stayed out a week. But here's the lesson. A year before I banged up my shoulder and it hurt like hell and I didn't go to a doctor. 
A year goes by, I injure my shoulder again, and it doesn't hurt quite as much, but I just knew internally something was wrong. Doctor says, you need surgery. I say, what if I don't have surgery? And he says, within six months, arthritis will lock up your shoulder and you'll lose the use of your arm. Oh. Okay, so I'll have the surgery. <laughs> but the thing is, a year before I banged up my shoulder and I did not know that was a possibility. If I had done the same injury the year before and due to my own bullheadedness or ego, I did not go to a doctor. By the time I realized there was a problem, I would have really been, really had a lot hard time, really had to yeah. a problem. It would have been life altering, right? Hard to train people with one arm. <laughs> and what about, so just let me clarify this. So the pictures we're seeing here, so the two pictures where you've got the clear sort of swelling on the bicep. Is that a different injury? That wasn't a shoulder, that was a bicep tear or rupture or something? No, see the shoulder injury, the, I had completely ruptured the subscapularis, which okay. is the rotator cuff by itself creates internal rotation mm -hmm. between the scapula and the rib cage. That was completely ruptured off the humerus. So that had to be repaired. And how did you do that, sorry? Oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, that's a very heroic story. I'll tell you. Was it the pool cover? Was it yes, that? it was. <laughs> yes, I remember we, because we spoke about it, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. So that, now in reality, I probably had some wear and tear in there and the pool hmm. cover just pushed it over the brink. But so I fully ruptured the subscapularis. I seven, eight, seven eighths tore the supraspinatus, which is on top. Mm -hmm. Rotator cover yeah. on top. Yeah. The biceps tendon had jumped its canal and was throwing off the mechanics inside my shoulder and creating its own tendonitis. Okay. And so they repaired all that, and then they also did a decompression, which means they shave away the arthritis and some of the bone to give you more internal room in the shoulder. However, for about six weeks afterwards, you, your hand is in a sling and you're not supposed to move your arm mm -hmm. to make sure the surgery holds. And as a result, all the fluid just settles in your, settles. Oh, I see. Yeah. Above your elbow. And to end up with that deformity there, which is why I say um, emotionally, it's just potentially a disaster. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. at this point, I, I had enough reading of rehab and sports medicine books. I knew what to expect. I think many of us who train with weights have a certain ego gratification involved. So <laughs> to look at that was, you know. It got my. He kind of looked like that guy that injected loads of fat in his arms to make himself look That's big. Right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> But no, that, that wasn't that. that uh, yeah, that was an interesting process. But I think since many of us trainers tend to be physically active on our own, whether it's sports or outdoor stuff or whatever, and, and especially as we get older and the tissues get less forgiving, if you get banged up, it's not the time to tough it out. Because I, I missed a week of training, then I went back. I probably should have taken a month. Okay. From a healing point of view, an energy point of view. But I took a week because I didn't want to, I didn't want to test whether the clients would come back after a month. A week I knew they would come back from, but in two weeks maybe, but a month I was like, yeah, that, that they might find something else. So again, individual personal trainers, we tend to do sports, tend to be active, especially as you get older, manage that, right? We don't get sick pay or we don't get. But so what are you saying there? So if you're a personal trainer listening to this. Be mindful of the extracurricular activities that you decide to do slash anything that you decide to do from what it sounds like, as it may have obviously an impact on your earnings and ability to, to train, train clients and that type of thing. Yeah. And, and just manage it. Like I said, the, the big takeaway is I didn't know I could injure myself so bad right. to be life altering. Hmm. If you go and they say, listen, you're going to need physical therapy. If it's anything other than a life altering result, then you can make up your own mind. But when I sent my CAT scan to every physical therapist I knew and every single physical therapist said, when is your surgery? I realized, oh, I have a problem here. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And now we move back towards the nature of personal training. So right. this, this slide we have here, this is the stuff we learned from in the 1970s, the muscle magazines and such. The one on the left, the muscular development with a man named Ken Holbert on the cover, who I never heard from or saw again. First magazine I ever bought 
flip it open. The very first article is about a, a Pennsylvania man named Douglas Forth who strang got strangled in his basement because he missed a bench press and the bar rolled onto his neck and he strangled and died. Jesus. Yeah. And I said, boy, what the hell am I getting into here? <laughs> Then the next one, Here's Power For You by David Manners. He, he's a Long Island guy, the other side of New York for me. Many versions of this book. This book, one of the first physical books I saw on weight training. And while he had pictures of bodybuilders from, say, the 1940s to the 1970s in it, the way he wrote it was much less hyperbolic than the muscle magazines. It was much more matter of fact. The instruction was much more matter of fact. So that was another, that, so that one was particularly useful at the time. Mm -hmm. Then we have a picture, we have muscle builder power from, with Arnold on the cover in all his fully ripped, fully vain glory. And this was the magazine that made everyone who knew me say, what the hell are you getting into? Oh, uh, really? <laughs> yes. A very popular image of him wearing that really strange outfit. The, the well, yellow straps over each shoulder. Yeah. Th so that the yellow straps are attached to a piece of plastic called the arm blaster. That oh, was, right. I see. That held your elbows in place as you did curls. Okay. But what they didn't tell you was that dug into your ribs and abdomen so much it hurt like hell to use that, 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 oh. that device. <laughs> yeah, it hurt like hell. Right. And obviously he's loaded with veins. Uh, well, actually compared to today's bodybuilders, probably not that bad, but at the time, like I said, my parents, my friends, my siblings, what the hell are you getting into? Right. Oh, stero steroids and male porn. What could go wrong? Let's go, let's go, let's go. Today's episode is sponsored by Imagine Strength, the game changer in safe, simple, and effective high intensity training machines. When it comes to HIT, Imagine Strength is your go to for intelligently designed, efficient, and affordable equipment. Their team is passionate about HIT, and it shows in every piece they craft. So why are Imagine Strength the right choice? Number one, they tailor make their equipment for HIT Studios. Number two, they provide cost-effective solutions for your business. And number three, they are committed to ongoing innovation and refinement. Ready to take your HIT business to the next level? Visit imaginestrength.com to discuss your needs and find the perfect gear for your studio. Join the HIT revolution of Imagine Strength and transform your workout experience today. Let's go. Funny thing about that, so that was in the 70s, and you didn't have bodybuilders in movies to speak of. And like, and I, an example of a well-built actor was, say, Charles Bronson or James Caan. So right. trim and fit, but not big muscles. And obviously, since then, we've had all the, the Stallone movies, the action movies, the Marvel movies. And I yep. remember I asked, the, I asked the interns one day who grew up with this stuff. I said, listen. I'm going to show you a picture. Give me your first, your first reaction. And I showed them a picture of Arnold from the time. And they said, oh, that's gross. They're all female interns for the most part, right? As for the well. most part. Yeah. I said, interesting. Do you like the Marvel movies? Yeah. How about way Thor, Captain America? How about those guys? Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. How about Henry Cavill? Oh yeah, he's fine. Hugh Jackman. Oh yeah, he's fine. I said, what's the difference? And it was a combination of the posing, the shaving. But the thing that really was interesting is the disparity between the lats and the waist. Interesting. They, they, they took that as completely gross. And I said, that's interesting because interesting every male trains to get that. <laughs> Hang on. But the weird thing is that, so like you take like Chris Hemsworth when he played four, like the disparity between his lats and his waist would be the same as Mike Mensa right there or probably Arnold. Similar. You know something? I, I, I maybe, but the posing aspect of it was also a turnoff, which is also interesting yes. because I said, wait a minute, when Chris Evans is holding onto a building in one arm and a helicopter in the other arm and his biceps are popping, you don't think that's posing? And they were like, no, that's acting. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is there a scene so, where he does that? Yes, it's in, in Civil War, I think. Oh, I love to check that one out. That sounds pretty yeah. cool. He's got a tight yeah. t-shirt on. He's trying to hold a helicopter in one arm and hold on to the building in the other arm. And of course, he's just doing a double biceps pose. Of course. Of course. <laughs> standard. But, yeah. they, but they interpreted that as, oh, no, that's gross. So I, I trying... do enjoy those movies, but they're just, obviously, they're a huge moneymaker. And there's just so many of them. I just lose track. 
And some of them I just thought were really bad, but some of them were good, to be fair. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I find it interesting how the image of the muscle man in movies has changed. Mm. Because in the 60s, the muscle men were portrayed as morons in the movies. So you think of the Muscle Beach movies or the Muscle Man was just the... The early Arnie movies, right? Even earlier in Arnold, when it was Peter Lupus and Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon in these beach movies, they were used for scenery. They were used to be made fun of. If they had any kind of speaking or act or, or role to play, it was usually as a Dumbo. It was only in the 80s with Arnold and Stallone and Lundgren and guys like that, that all of a sudden the heavy muscle man became the hero or at least the protagonist. Mm -hmm. So I find it very interesting how watching that, that transition. In fact, the, the Henry Cavill made a movie, The Man from Uncle, and it, it wasn't a big physique movie for him, but the, in the original Man from Uncle TV show from the sixties, Napoleon Solo, the character Henry Cavill plays, he's slight and he's trim. And there's at least a couple of episodes where he has to fight a muscle man. And not only does he beat him, he makes the muscle man look like an idiot. 50 years later, Henry Cavill <laughs> is now Napoleon Solo and he is the muscle man. <laughs> so That's strange. And anyway, and now on the right, there's the first Mensa cover that I picked up. It's a great cover, isn't it? April 76. And that was his writing at the time was such a step above the rest of the muscle magazine writing. That was the beginning of, because even though I was looking at these magazines, because it was the only place to learn, it was yeah. a few places to learn and print how to lift. I also took them with a big grain of salt because you could just tell they were just written to be over the top and, and overly enthusiastic. And how, how, old, how old were you when you, when, when you knew to take them with a grain of salt? Because that's quite a mature mindset because I think most of us have been duped and not do, do obviously you get heavily inspired and the story and the hyperbole is really appealing and you want to just get carried away with it but like how old were you when you knew better my dad looking over my shoulder saying you don't believe that do you all oh, right that, 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 that helped yeah <laughs> that helped um or, or the opposite potentially but but here's, see, here's the thing um even so i was in high school when this stuff came out so i so men's that magazine is april 76 i graduated in june of 76 Okay. To me, the difference was the Arnold articles, which you find out now were complete fiction. He's talking about working two hours a workout, three times a day, six days a week. There was no way I was even going to attempt that. And Mensa was coming out saying, no, I did a half hour, four times a week for the Mr. America. Okay. This is the guy I'm going to listen to. Mm -hmm. I think based on, based on some of the podcasts you hear with some of these older guys, I suspect the training wasn't as disparate as we were led to believe. I don't think Arnold was training six hours a day, and I don't think Mensa was training a half hour three times a week. I, I think it was probably a lot closer than the magazines portrayed it. But uh, since most of us aren't going to have to worry about becoming that built, it's a moot point, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Now, saying in the world of magazines, which you guys don't have the advantage of enjoying, this magazine, Sportswise New York, local, I think it was local to several markets, Boston, New York, and in amongst the cigarette ads and the beer ads, they would cover sports and fitness in that particular city. So you see here, so first of all, this cover, the strange story of Norlis inventor Arthur Jones. And then introducing the modern athlete, that's, that was one of Joan's contemporaries, antagonists, what have you, Gideon Ariel. And they had multiple page articles on each guy and, and the work they were doing. Mm -hmm. On the left, you see an ad featuring the Nautilus pullover, right? With Nautilus and fairly, you know. At the time, racket clubs mm -hmm. were putting Nautilus lines in so that if you had barbell gyms, who weren't quick to embrace Nautilus, the racket clubs where you had courts, they could shit a line of Nautilus in one court. Now, what the guy's wearing for pants, I have no idea. But anyway, but, but, so below that ad, you see the ad for the Paris Health Club. None of these places exist anymore, by the way. 
Of course. And that's a Nautilus abdominal the clamshell crunch machine. Got it, yeah. On the far right, you see the ad to New York Health and Racket. And while it doesn't have Nautilus prominent, it does mention, it misspells it, but it does mention the Nautilus line of equipment. <laughs> and then this write-up is about the Sports Training Institute, which is the place I, I got my chops out of. And actually what led me to Sports Training Institute was a SportsWise magazine. And above the title, above the logo was the man who turns fitness into a science. And it was about Michael O'Shea, the owner of Sports Training Institute. And that's what led me right there. Interesting. For work. So Sports Training Institute um, existed about 25 years, 75 to 2000 or so. It was originally, say from 74 on the, I don't know this for a fact because I wasn't there, but the Nautilus showroom in New York City. And so they had many mm -hmm. Nautilus prototypes. And in order to demonstrate it, they would train people on the Nautilus prototypes. And however, people did not say, good, I'm going to buy a dozen machines. People just said, I'll pay you to train me. Cool, sir. Which was not what Jones and the Nautilus people wanted. So they cut bait and the training became the business. When I got there in 1983, there were two commercial locations that were open to the public. So one was at 239 East 49th Street, which is 49th Street and 2nd Avenue in the basement of a brownstone. Could not have been less designed to be functioned as a gym or a personal training studio. You went down a huge flight of steps. You went to a reception area and locker room. You went down another huge flight of steps. And then the training floor is about 2,500 square feet. The second location, which is right, that picture right there, that was in the Doral Hotel. And that was open yeah. to the public also, but that was specifically cleaned up with mirrors and carpeting. The first place was a lot funkier. Now, at the time I was there, they also had what they called corporate fitness, which was really private personal training studios for the top executives at certain firms. So it wasn't what corporate fitness turned into, which was more of a the bigger population. And they had like a Morgan Stanley was a financial house. The racket and tennis club was an old rackets club. And then Scott and Arps, which I think they still have uh, as a law firm. They had you have, any, you have any interesting stories training anyone really prominent, Phil? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, be patient. Oh, okay. Um, be patient. <laughs> they had physical therapy in New York and New Jersey. And they had the New York, the New Jersey Devils as we had a guy assigned to the Devils to train them there at their facility. Mm -hmm. And that picture there, that was in the nineties where I was trying to, when I had gone back as the manager and I was trying to rebuild because between the eighties and the nineties, personal training had taken off in New York city outside of sports training Institute. It was a much more competitive environment then. So for all the high intensity guys, so at the two thirty at the East 49th street location, we had all the original Nautilus double machines, the leg extension, leg press, the double shoulder, the double chest. We had, it wasn't the blue monster, but it was a pullover with an attached pull down. We had the circle behind neck with the behind the neck pull down. Mm -hmm. We had the biceps and triceps. We were facing each other. Um, these things were monsters. They were huge. <laughs> they were huge. They were tall. They occupied a lot of square footage. Um, and this is, when you say doubles, this way you could have two exercises, right? So you had the leg extension and a leg press on the one machine. That's how it worked. Is that right? Yeah. I, for I forgot that this is not no longer prominent. Yes. You had the leg extension. Yeah. And. The leg press was on the same frame right in front of you. So you stopped the yeah. legs and put your feet on the platform and just went to the leg press. See, p people listening to this probably think, Lawrence, you should know that because you've done 430 episodes. I have definitely discussed the Nautilus double machines with plenty of guests. I just forget. And I've never used them, I don't think. I might have see, seen some of them before in certain not, studios. And you don't see a lot of them around anymore. No, no. Not only Obviously, I don't they, come from that era either. So there you go. <laughs> they're young, young and... Um, Barely. But, but so they were huge footprints, huge height. All right. Yeah. 
and a bear to maintain because it was all, it was chains. It was chains going around sprockets. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the chains had some oil or some kind of grease on them. And when dust or debris would get in the chain, it would, it, it, you would lift the weight up and you take the sheet off and the weight would stay there because there was so much friction on the chain or on the guide rod. So the Sports Training Institute had a full-time employee just doing maintenance on the machines. Oh, wow. The later Norla's versions were much lower maintenance. They did away with the chains and the, the chains and the sprockets. If you read Ellington's earlier stuff, the earlier original Norla's books, you'll see pictures of the double machines. We also had some unique single machines. We had what they called the dual poly pullover. Each arm worked independently and you're supposed to do the pullover. Mm. One arm stayed in place, the other arm came up and then he came here and all right. That was, that was so easy to teach. <laughs> Sounds like it. No. Then we had single, uh, the single leg extension without the leg press attached, the face down leg curl. We had multi biceps, multi triceps, and the multi exercise machine, which the multi exercise, I think people know it's like the chin dip with the weight stack that mm -hmm. adds weight, not assists weight. The multi biceps and triceps, it was like the same frame, and your arms are here, and you could go both at the same time or alternate or what they called a kinetic. We had the dual poly hip and back, where you lied on your back, you push both legs out. One leg held, then one hip flexed and extended, then the other hip flexed and extended. The original abductor, adductor, which just tore you apart. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had, we had some prototypes, like the hip and back. It was both legs at one time. But unlike the one today, this one, you had a, a crank and a ratchet. And you just have to ratchet the person to line up the hips with the axis. And there's a reason why you don't see that one anymore either. <laughs> because people right. freak out. They did not like the sensation of having their knees forced up into their face. Yeah. Wow. So Interesting. they also had Kieser compressed air machines. An air compressor is very noisy. So that, so those did not, you don't see too many of them anymore. Uh, Universal DVR. Um, Cybex used to be more prominent at the time also. And they had a bike and an upper body ergometer. Actually, the upper body ergometer is on the right in this picture. So it's a, a bike, an arm bike. Mm. And those are based on hydraulics. So you would set the speed, say 60 RPMs, and it would match your effort. So if you tried to crank as fast as you could, it would still go 60 RPMs, but the hydraulic needle would go all the way over to the right because you were putting the effort in. And if you backed off, you'd still go 60 RPMs but the needle, the needle you see you had adaptive resistance all the way back then. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'd be it not a thousand times a second or whatever the current technologies might claim. And a bear to maintain because oh, the hydraulics actually, yeah. were, were kind it's of huge fragile. looking at the picture here. These, oh, uh, that's only half of it. No, that's really only half of it. That's just the cardio section. The weight section extended far looking at this it extended far to the left. That was just, a, that was just the, the, you can see here, Laura Giordano on the Versa climber. I'm on the, the concept two rower. Oh yeah. And I'm in the mirror twice. So it looks like we have three people rowing, but it's only me. <laughs> oh yeah. And then we have, we I'm have the, the by that. <laughs> we have the, the stair ma master patient maker device. So the stair master used to have a fixed height step instead of. They eventually turned into like levers. The fixed height set meant someone had to step that high. And if somebody was short, it wore their knees out fairly quickly. And then we had the arm bikes. So the weights was off to the left. Yeah. So this was the Doral at 39th and 5th. And here we have some ink at the time. We didn't have social media, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but we, they did have media connections. On the left, that picture was from Sports Illustrated in a big article on fitness in general. And the owner, Mike O'Shea, is on the Versa Climber on the right. And all the way on the left, that, not the exerciser, but the guy on the, uh, standing on the floor, the late Chris Mead, he was probably one of the first full-on celebrity trainers. 
Um, What's his name again? Sorry, Chris Mead. He he passed away. Nineties uh, or so, um, okay. but he was. Um, see all these these celebrities. <laughs> Chris okay. was the guy responsible for bringing the celebrities. However, he had the contacts. Um, I see. So this article in Sports Illustrated, multiple pages, features Mike and, and others. Mike's quote here is, I'm not a physical fitness preacher. I don't want to testify about the fitness. And I had forgotten that was his attitude, but boy, he, that, that's me to a T, boy. <laughs> he had more influence on me than I realized. Mm. Many of us, of my contemporaries from the 80s, really owe him our careers. Not overtly, not like he was saying, I'm going to build your career. But he did build this business up and he drew all of us into it. And every other place, at least in Manhattan, sprang, came from this place. Oh, yeah, like I said, I really owe the guy my, my career. He also, a little later than that picture on the left, became the fitness editor for Parade Magazine which when it used to have Sunday newspapers in the U.S., was a magazine that was included. And uh, look, there's somebody we know demonstrating push-ups. Look at that push guy. Demonstrating push-ups in the 90s with a little bit darker hair. <laughs> and then on the right was something we put in Club Industry magazine. magazine. Club Industry was a trade magazine, print magazine in the 90s. And so we got some... so so. At the time, with no social media, you got ink. You got Mike never paid for advertising, but we he got quoted and, and featured. Well, we were in New York; you had access to media, and so now these are all celebrities of the time. So you guys may not Let's see if I know any of these guys. <laughs> oh, I do Go know ahead. some of the names. Do I know? Should I just tell you? Uh, hmm. Obviously, oh Mike Mensa, Jane Fonda. I know those two, Mick Jagger, Al Pacino, Barry Sears, and now Chris Mead, but I only just learned that one. So yeah, that doesn't really know, count. Yeah, I don't know the rest. Yeah, so I talk, talk me through. All right. Yeah. So upper right, the, the picture, that's, that was the mayor, Ed Koch, mayor mm -hmm. of New York for a number of years and a local politician. Um, oh, Jeff Goldblum as well. I know him, obviously. Okay. Yeah. So, so below Ed is an actor named David Hedison. Now, you don't know David Hedison. Sean Connery, James Bond movies. Yeah. He plays Felix Leiter, his American counterpart. Oh, so I not see. A big, not a big role, but he always works steadily. Um, guys my age <laughs> might know the show Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea from the early 60s. He was the, I see. He was the second lead, and he was always getting the crap kicked out of him on that show, which I, okay. I may have mentioned to him while I was training to him. So, oh, so, so when I had the chance, I would very discreetly ask him, could you give me a signed picture? And they did. So I had cool. visions of I had visions of lining the wall like a New York deli with the celebrities. But anyway, so these are celebrities at the time. And again, keep in mind the eighties and nineties. Mm. John F. Kennedy Jr. was a celebrity. It was a client, Caroline Kennedy. So hang on, you trained all of these people at least once, did you? Or... I did not. Chris okay. Mead trained men. Chris Mead trained many of them and brought many of them in. Yeah. I'll I'll tell you the ones that I specifically trained. Now Billy Jean King, the tennis and okay. Arthur Ashe were tennis stars of the, of the day. I wasn't there for Menser, but one of the old trainers told me that Menser trained there and, and he trained with them. And then we had the New, New Jersey Devils. Jane Fonda, I think even today's trainers know who Jane Fonda is. Mm -hmm. Jeff Goldblum, who you still see in some of the Marvel movies, Slax, Kevin Klein, Bernadette Peters, Bianca Jagger, who was Jagger's probably ex-wife at the time. She trained with Chris. Now, so Mick Jagger and Pacino and Connie Chung. Con okay, so Jagger, Pacino, the actor, Connie Chung, news, newscaster at the time. What Mike did, so we were paid crap. This is Michael O'Shea we're talking about now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we were paid crap. They were charging $30 an hour. We were getting paid $6 an hour. Now, 20%, which I don't think is an unheard of split, even today, if you work for a, a, a big gym. But the thing was, we were guaranteed, we, we pretty much were guaranteed five, eight-hour days full of half-hour appointments. 
But if somebody called and wanted a trainer sent to their home, Mike decided, I don't want to get involved in policing that. I don't want to worry about the insurance of that. Just give it to a trainer who, who you want to give a bonus to. So Mick Jagger didn't want to go to Sports Training Institute. Mm -hmm. But he wanted a trainer sent to him. So they gave it to a friend of mine to train. So he went off and trained Mick Jagger. He would do his shift at sports training institute, go train Jagger and get paid directly. Another Very friend of mine did the same with Pacino. I had that arrangement with Connie Chung, who at the, again, at the time was a, a prominent newscaster. Mm -hmm. That would never happen today. <laughs> that would okay. never happen today. Where, oh, I think the house would try to. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. So what would happen is you had the, you had the eight hour shift, which kept you in the flow of prospects. And it was, it was like your bread and butter, but you didn't make much money at it. But if you had one or two of these clients on the side, okay, now we're talking about, now you're talking about making a living. Plus it's fun hobnobbing with some of these people. Anyway, Patty Lapone, again, probably don't know her. Nope. Uh, Huey Lewis in the news had oh, yeah. the eighties, eighties band. They had an album sports. They had the opening party or the album release party in sports training Institute. Laura Brannigan was a pop star at the time. Imus was a radio guy at the time. Connie Chung, Ed Bradley, Bill Butel, they were local news people. Barry Sears, the zone diet guy I got to work with and know a little mm -hmm. bit. Sterling Lord, th that's a reach. He was a literary agent. That after I trained him, I started seeing his name all over the place. Before you train the people, you're not aware of it. And then uh, Blair Sables, she was an author who wrote The Body of America that not only she mentioned Mike in it, she mentions Roger in it quite a few places, Roger Schwab. Cool. And I do think that a lot of, it was the only game place in town to do personal training from say the mid seventies to the early eighties. And Chris had a particular connection with celebrities, so he was able to bring a lot of that in. So now, let me see here. So Connie Chung, so he said interesting stories about training people. She lived in the Dakota at the time, which was, and not long after John Lennon got shot at the Dakota. So this is 83 or 84 or so. And so I would go to her apartment to train her, and every now and then she'd say, I'd like to go out, it's a nice day, let's go out to Central Park. Okay. So we go out for a walk or a jog in Central Park. And if somebody approached her and recognized her, she would be overwhelmingly gracious and appreciative. And, oh, how thank you for saying something. Have a nice day. But she would magically appear on the other side of me from wherever the person approached. <laughs> so if Connie was on my right and someone approached from the right, she would walk behind me, get on my left, and then she'd be very gracious. But she made sure I was between her and the person. So like protection. One day I said, one day I, said I, I know what you're doing. <laughs> Realize if I have to do bodyguard work, I charge extra. She goes, trust me, if you have to do bodyguard work, I'll pay you extra. So, <laughs> so she was fun. That's funny. Who else did I personally train? I, I dealt with Mayor Koch. So he trained with us for a very long time. And one day he has, he has a heart attack during the training session. Oh, wow. And, and we literally happened to be next to a police station, a fire and EMS station. So the many details later, he gets off to the hospital and everything works out. And the first, but the first media I hear about it over the radio in the gym is an anonymous call sent Mayor Koch to the hospital this morning. That, at that point, that was true. Mm -hmm. And then as he started feeling better day by day, all of a sudden he kept amplifying the story until by Saturday, he, put, he has a column in one of the local tabloids and he writes how, I just want, I owe it all to my cardiologist for teaching me to be aware of my body. He goes, I knew I was having trouble that morning. I instructed the trainer to get me a car, to notify my doctor, to do this, to do that. And I'm reading this article. I'm saying, Ed, you didn't know your name. Yeah. yeah. You were crying for mommy. What do you mean you mm -hmm. barking out orders? So like every day he felt better. And every day the politician in him had to make him look more heroic. Mm -hmm. So after that blew over, I said, hey, Ed, could you do me a favor? Could you give me an autograph picture? And could you sign one of your novels to my mother? 
and he couldn't have been more gracious and <laughs> more <laughs> effusive. It was quite a character. And then Sparky Lyle's as asterisk. Sparky Lyle, in, in one of the magazine articles about Sports Training Institute, the story is how the Yankees, he was breaking down. The Yankees sent him to train at Sports Training Institute, and he came back and had a great year. So I run into him one day, not at Sports Training Institute. And I say, oh, hi, how you doing? I work at the place we used to train at, Sports Training Institute. And he looks at me, he smiles, he goes like this. I said, no, I, I work there. I know Mike O'Shea. I, he goes, no, no I, you work there. I never worked out there. I said, what do you mean? I just read this article on uh, detailing your rehab. He goes, look, I don't do that shit. The Yankees wanted me to go. He goes, so I told the people, listen, you can say I came here. You can say whatever you want, but I'm not doing this and I'm not coming here. Wow. <laughs> so the story got out that, uh, so the story got out that, how good sports training was training professional baseball players and other professional baseball players came to sports training to, Amazing. to either rehab or exercise. And oops, yeah. it's 40 years, it's 40 years ago. Statue of limitations is over. <laughs> so anyway, okay. so now all of that memory lane stuff about the nature of personal training. So I, I came to the, these conclusions, which that the job of the trainer is not to worry about the perfect workout. Your job is to give the client a better workout than they would have had on your own. Because the perfect workout, let's face it, even within the niche of hit, the prescribed perfect workout has changed several times in the 40 years, right? So don't worry about as much as the perfect workout as a better workout for that person in front of you. Um, and very related to that is, you know, now I made these numbers up, 51 to 99% of success is the poor communication into person. Oh, why didn't you just say 50%? Oh, no, no, because it's... Am I missing? Yes, you are missing something. Okay. Because when I saw at Sports Training Institute, and when I was the manager and I had a dozen trainers working under me, I would have some trainers that were technically really good and very well right. educated. And they could not hold the case a client load. And I saw other trainers who technically were not that good and did not have great credentials and they were book solid. I see. Okay. And I sat down one day with my clipboard, my pad and the pen, and I made note of what the busy ones did and what the other ones did. And it was all communication skills. So I, and I. And what this means, by the way, is that you as the trainer, it's really up to you to know the right thing to do by the client because the client doesn't have that vocabulary to say, gee, should I be doing a, you know, should I be doing a, a pull down with my hands parallel or with my hands close? They don't have the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. They're going to do pretty much whatever the trainer tells them if that rapport and communication is there. If the trainer is a stiff personality wise, it's not going to last no matter how good the protocol is, no matter how educated the trainer is. Like I said, I took that list of what the busy trainers did interpersonally and what the other trainers didn't do. And I call them into the office. I said, why is she look? And they mm -hmm. said, oh, personality. And I'm like, yeah, but that's a bad answer because you're doomed. And I said, look, here's a whole bunch of things she does that you don't do. And really small stuff like if the person's on the mat doing crunches or push-ups, they'd be standing over them like, like intimidated. Like arms crossed, yeah. And I'd say, no, get on the mat with the person. You know, mm -hmm. get on the left. Or even the client would be on a station and the trainer would be looking ahead to the next station they wanted to go to. But the client thought the trainer wasn't paying attention to him. Yep. Now that trainer meant well, they were, but the client just thought I was trainers zoning out, right? Or they would stand where the client couldn't see them. And they might've been watching meticulously, watching the client's form, spotting, what have you, but the client didn't see it, right? And these were all little things, or, or even making eye contact with the client when they came up. If you don't have it in you to, to be a big, enthusiastic smile, slap on the back kind of guy, that's fine. But you still got to make eye contact. Cool. And some of these guys just couldn't do it. 
So I, I give them a list of this stuff and they're busy writing it on their arm. And I watched and it lasted like a half hour. Like after a half hour, they just snapped back to their original. So I concluded that I could recognize it and I can teach it, but the trainer might not be able to learn it. So what I started to do was like, I, I would give everyone a shot at it, but the ones that didn't have that, those intangibles, I just knew it wasn't going to pan out for them. And if I saw somebody with those qualities, I would make a point of saying, you ever think of being a personal trainer? Mm -hmm. And I would yeah. help them get started. Um, and th th this is also a good lesson, isn't it? For those things about hiring trainers, it's like, if you get the hiring piece wrong, if you just get the wrong person, then it might not matter how much coaching you do, might all be for naught. Just might not be the right fit for the role. You might be able to coach it and you might be able to break it down. They may not be able to learn it. Exactly. And, and I say that, by the way, as somebody who's not a natural people person. See, I'm good one-to-one. -one. We're talking, oh, I'm good here one-to-one. -one. Sure. I'm good with clients one-to-one. -one. I'm good at, say, rec, where it's all like-minded people. Outside of that, though, I'm not a real big party goer. I'm not a, no one's going to confuse me for the mayor. But I did realize, yeah, my first shift to Sports Training Institute, six o'clock in the morning. I assumed being 25 years old and full of energy, if I was paying this kind of money, I would want something I couldn't do for myself. And I train pretty hard. So these people have been coming here. They must really want to train hard. Mm. And by 10 o'clock, I had three vomiting clients. <laughs> and I instantly realized, okay, I may have missed. <laughs> I instantly knew, all right, that's not why they're coming. And I instantly backed off and just assumed everyone it was their first day in a gym because I could always make the workout harder. But once you push it too hard, it's very tough to get it back. I see. Which in its way, so I didn't say to myself, okay, I have to learn interpersonal skills. But I just observed what was happening and see how it would go, go over and I would just intuitively change it. Now I recognize them as rapport and communication. Right. So if somebody wants to be a trainer, <laughs> keep in mind that's really the key you may see somebody like i said i see plenty of awful technical trainers make a lot of money and do really well mm -hmm. it's ultimately and this is, a, this is a cliche but it couldn't be more true this is a people business right the protocol and such the facility they may get people in the door but once they're in the door it's that people connection that that keeps them in the door so. so just so you're aware, we're going to need to like really whiz through Bill because we're going to need to wrap yeah, very soon. Fine. That's okay. Cool. Yeah, Thank that's you. fine. So then now semi-related to the personal training, like the, the second 20 years of the career is when I started doing presentations, moment arm exercise and, and such. And this is the first one I did in, this is the first original one I did. So I, I had previous to this, I had, I had delivered like the NSCA biomechanics review and I had done some teaching for world instructor training schools in the U.S., which certifies people. This was the first, 2005, 2006 is when I put my own ideas in a presentation. And I delivered this to Karen Heffernan and biomechanics for machine training. And I went over many of the things I still go over now, screw hole mechanism, spine involvement. The one difference was in 2005, there wasn't quite the variety of equipment like U.S. health clubs had a very similar package of equipment. And since 2005, as CrossFit and boot camps and stuff came along, the equipment got lesser in the health clubs and you have more versions out there. Fortunately, the biomechanics and sports medicine stays the same. So it's always ap applicable. Muscle torque curves we touched on last week. Cantilever design and the curls spine involvement with the positioning for the leg press and screw hole mechanism. Mm -hmm. And I've since learned to play with PowerPoint a little better and black letters on a white background. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. These are some of the certifications. Many. If not really. The first two from Nautilus, those are participation trophies. <laughs> <laughs> Do parents still make fun of that? Is that still a thing? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'd say so. Okay. Although it's, although obviously it's a little bit more sensitive these days. Okay, well, this was your, you got this for attending. You didn't take a test. You didn't have to regurgitate anything. You got this for attending. 
but it's still it's still a nice novelty. All right. The NSCA ones that I earned on my own time studying that material, passing the test, the ace one, and Gracie Jiu Jitsu just because I liked it. Mm-hmm. But what I would tell people when they, if, if somebody was interested in becoming a personal trainer, what I would tell people is five steps train yourself, because it couldn't be more phony if you don't exercise yourself to tell someone you can tell them how to get in shape. Train someone else, because you got to get what's in your head out of your mouth into that person's ears, into their brain, and get their body to do what you want, which can be a lot harder than it looks. Mm -hmm. The third thing would be to get certified because, number one, it validates what you claim to be able to do, especially as someone who doesn't know the particulars about certification. What do you think these days are are like the ideal certifications to get that hold the most credibility in the U.S.? I don't know anymore. I maintain the ACE. Yeah, because and they, the N- yeah. I maintain ACE because the NSCA, which I maintained for many years, but they are very exclusively sports oriented. That's not my clientele. Okay. And at the time I got the ACE, they were pretty solidly cardio strength stretching. Right. And since then, they've gotten very much into a lot of the esoterics of functional training. So I maintain it just in case they put licensing in the U.S. What does that mean by maintain it? You need to pay annually or something like that? Yeah, you have to pay for a certain amount of continuing education every so many years. Got it. In the U.S., in some states, they've licensed personal trainers, which I'm not necessarily opposed to, but I don't want to jump through new hoops if they put licensing in. Yeah. And generally when they put licensing in if you're an existing personal trainer with a credential they grandfather you in and you don't have to jump through the new hoops right now frankly at my age and at my scale the chance of me having to jump through new hoops are pretty small but i do maintain it because i do deal with interns so i want to have some substance behind i want to have some credential to to justify if it ever comes up anyway so Train yourself, train others, get certified, get insurance, and then get a job. And you get insurance just in case. All right. You're probably not, knock on wood, you're probably not getting sued and losing, but why be the test case? And the fact that the premiums in the U.S. aren't that expensive tells you the insurance companies don't think there's a big chance they're going to lose a suit. Mm Mm-hmm. Still, as somebody with a house and a family, I've always played safe. Just very quick, get... sorry, Bill, just very quick back on certification. So I just wanted to add, is it NASM? Is the other one? Is that North what? American? No. What does yeah, that stand for? Um, NASM, National Sports Academy, Something Sports, sports medicine. medicine. What's the NA? Yeah. National Academy. And at that one and ACE, I thought, were like the ones which have the most credibility. I know that a lot of us, like you, you were hinting at there, some of the content we might not fully agree with, but something like Hit Uni, and obviously the course you did as well, could be much more useful in terms of like practical application. But having maybe Hit Uni and having uh, ACE or an NASM, that to me seems like the kind of optimal. So for lo- it, the longest time, the, for the longest time, the big three in the U.S. were ACE, NSCA. ACE was fitness clubs. NSCA was sports conditioning, and ACSM was more the more academic. ACSM, um, that's it. Sorry, American yeah. College of Sports Medicine. Those were the yeah, big three. That's what I meant. Mm-hmm. And if you're already an academic, you could probably do ACSM. If you're teaching yourself. I can only speak at the time. I was able to study for the NSCA certifications and the A certifications just by having the materials and putting the time in. There are multiple other alphabet organizations. I would still probably lean towards those three. Okay. But, and you're right, HIT Uni is probably more specific to what HIT people want to do. But, and again, people can, do, reasonable people can disagree. There is a value to understanding the cardio aerobic section and the flexibility section uh cool. but more more importantly though these there are national there are groups in the u.s that certify certifications right so ace acsm the longer ones are certified by those groups as having their materials vetted or or whatever mm-hmm. again i mainly do it though 
just in case licensing comes in so I can just be grandfathered in and not have new hoops to jump through. Mm -hmm. Now this slide, mastery, not mimicry. I saw this and I thought, wow, that is profound. That describes exactly what I'm doing with the personal training, with the biomechanics stuff. And then I realized it was a Grolsch beer ad. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, strange. It's strange. It. Yeah, yeah, oh, yes. B and R on it. It's but, all coming um, together for me now. Yeah, I, see. I was going to say, wait a minute, this is Grolsch beer. Maybe don't come to me for philosophy. <laughs> but no, it's a great, it's a great line. It makes me think of John Little said, if I'm not getting this wrong, said a similar something that was synonymous with this, which is. Be careful not to let your, was it flow down the river of another man's thoughts or another person's thoughts yeah, in terms okay. of just, I just think we're all guilty of reading our favorite people in here and then just repeating what they say without fully understanding it ourselves. You know something, Michael O'Shea, big influence in Ellington Darden, which I, mm -hmm. I don't think I've made a secret of. It doesn't mean I follow what they do. I don't mimic what they do. I don't do exactly mm -hmm. what they do. If, I, if all I was going to do is reword Ellington stuff, I wouldn't bother. Yeah, of course. Okay. But there's no denying their influence. And I like to think that over 40 years, I earned a living doing something I thought had some meaning and that I will, I'll have left behind a body of work that added something to the process. Oh, absolutely. Um, nice little niche I, for yourself. It didn't, I didn't set out that way, but that mm. every now and then you got to pop out of the daily grind and look back and realize, oh yeah, that is the way it, it worked. So. Awesome. Cool. Is this final slide or we got more? I believe that is, yes, that was, a, yes. Great. That's just, since you usually say, how can people get, people get in touch with you, Bill? I'll say. <laughs> so if you see me at a conference or at an in-service, feel free to come up to me because that's what I'm there for. Okay. It's better to be another philosophical line. It's better to be accessible than definitive. Also look at Simon's website, the Hit Uni website. Because in addition to the course that I wrote for him, he has blogs and podcast interviews. So there's a fair amount of free material if you want to vet what I'm saying before buying his course. Mm -hmm. I have a YouTube. I have a newsletter. I'll give you those links separately. If you're in the Cranberry, New Jersey area, of course, I'm available to train or a phone consultation. And of course, for any written materials, the Amazon bio page. Very good. So we'll obviously link all this up in the show notes for this. But if there is one, just one thing for people to remember, one takeaway, Bill, would it be to go and pick up a copy of Joint Friendly Fitness, your latest? You know what? That I think is about as comprehensive as I can get. So I think that incorporates the best parts of moment arm exercise, congruent mm -hmm. exercise, all the videos on YouTube. Well, all the presentations I did, I, I think that's the most, the most, there it is. I think that's my the, signed the, copy. The most, did I really? Yeah. He said for Lawrence, uh, enjoy. Hopefully it's worth the wait. <laughs> uh, oh, good. The intern did it right. <laughs> no, no, no. no, but I think that's, that's about as comprehensive as I, I'm ever going to get. I don't, some people like moment arm exercise. I don't disagree with them, but when I read it, I'm like, boy, I was really writing way up here because mm -hmm. I, I was mimicking the reference books I was using. And congruent exercise, I tried to be a little, I was trying to reflect the, the exercise industry at 2012. This one, I tried to write to be read, but not as a novel. I expect people to dip in and dip out and take what they need. So I, I don't expect somebody to, to memorize all the exercise and change the entire way of working people out. But maybe if all of a sudden they get what a, a client gets a pain in a joint, maybe they say, gee, let's see what Bill had to say about this exercise and yeah. clip through and just take the chunks he need. It's great for that. It's an amazing reference. We use it all the time. I was really annoyed I didn't have it last time we, we recorded together, which that episode will be out now and when people will listen to this or watch this. And I said to my colleague, I said, you better, because obviously everyone's been borrowing this book when they're like designing routines and work with clients. I said, you need to bring it in when I meet you next week because I need it. Oh, I need to uh, refresh my memory on a few things. So no, great to get it. And obviously I highly recommend it. It's, yeah, it's your most user-friendly manual for what you do uh, today for sure. And uh, yeah, it, it, I've read Moment Arm and Congruent way back and it was definitely more dense and, di and especially back then difficult for me to understand. I'm sure I'd be I'd do much better now. 
But no, it's awesome, Bill. We're very grateful for your body of work. And obviously they can go to Amazon, search Joint Friendly Fitness, and it'll probably come straight up. Uh, but again, everything you mentioned today, we'll make sure we link it up in the blog post. Um, Bill, before I wrap this one up, any final thoughts you want to share? I'm interested to hear the feedback we get in the last two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we can maybe use that for a um, Q&A as we discussed. Uh, yeah, the, it's very tempting to to take these walks down memory lane and not make it relatable. So I, I would hope people think of me as a resource rather than an expert, because because I'm not an expert. Like I, I'm not as academically as heavily credentialed, but I do have some experience and I do have my very specific body of work. And in, and sometimes even if you don't get even if the answer I give isn't, doesn't help, it maybe it gives you a way of thinking about the problem that you, that at least my answer sparked that thought process. Yeah, exactly. So, so let me leave it at that. Use me as a res uh, think of me as a resource, not an authority, not an expert. <laughs> You're very humble. Well, it's easy. It's easy. I'm surrounded by a bunch of Nick stuff in my caves. <laughs> <laughs> No, I appreciate it, Bill. Uh, again, thank you for doing this. Really appreciate it. This has been quite a just awesome sort of um, presentation on the history of training, as well as your advice to trainers on, on personal training tips about how to build a great career. Um, just learning about your own experience and time training, some interesting people and stories is really interesting to hear. And for everyone listening, to get the show notes for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com and search episode 431 and everything we mentioned today, all the links, all the stuff that Bill does, his website, et cetera, all be linked up there. Um, and until next time, thank you very much for listening. Let's go, let's go. Welcome to another episode brought to you by Imagine Strength, the future of safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Are you a hit studio owner looking for equipment that's not just top-notch, but also tailored to your specific needs? Imagine Strength is your answer. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength is revolutionizing the hit industry with their state-of-the-art yet affordable equipment. Their team doesn't just sell hit equipment, they live and breathe it. I've personally experienced their gear at the Resistance Exercise Conference, and let me tell you, it was an intense workout that I won't soon forget, in the best way possible, of course. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they provide customized solutions for hit studios. Number two, they have budget-friendly yet high-performance designs. And number three, they're committed to innovation and excellence in high-intensity training specifically. Founder Jeff Turner and his dedicated team are on a mission to make HIT accessible to everyone. Getting started is easy. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, consult with their expert team. And number three, choose the equipment that will skyrocket your business. Don't wait. Head over to ImagineStrength.com and elevate your hit studio today with Imagine Strength.